Uh, thanks, Ned. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be speaking about a new programming model for line rate switches. Uh, and what do I mean by programming a line rate switch here? So let me break down each of the two parts. When I say programmable, I mean this ability to express a new data plane algorithm. So this is any algorithm that modifies packet state, uh, I mean packet fields and or persistent switch state in the data plane as packets go through the switch. So here are some canonical examples. And we want to do this at line rate, which I'm defining as the highest capacity supported by dedicated hardware switches at any given point in time. So today that's 10 to 100 gigabits per second on 10 to 100 ports. So why care about this problem? Rather, why now? I think the reason is that for the first time, it's actually practical to build programmable switching chips that essentially run at the same performance as the fastest line rate chips and still provide some amount of programmability. And so a few examples are Intel's FlexPipe, Cavium's Explant, and Barefoot Stofino. So what sort of programmability do they provide, right? So they have one of these pipelines where packets show up into a parser. The programmer specifies the protocol format for the parser. Once the packets are parsed, they are looked up in a sequence of match action tables. Now these match action tables are far more flexible than open flow. You can match on arbitrary packet fields, and you can carry out actions by composing them from a small set of primitives that do packet field arithmetic. Yet, for all this, these programmable switches fall short of our requirements. Uh, and it's hard or close to impossible to program the algorithms that I mentioned earlier on these switches. And the reason for that is the hardware for these switches is actually great for stateless tasks, like forwarding, that don't manipulate any state in the data plane. By contrast, the algorithms that I mentioned, things like active queue management and congestion control, manipulate state in the data plane. For instance, red maintains a moving average of the queue size in the data plane. The second problem is that the languages to program these switches are fairly low level. So they require you to manually specify a sequence of match action tables that a packet needs to go through for the algorithm to work. So we have two concrete challenges here, which is one, can we program these data plane algorithms in a high level language? Ideally, it shouldn't be much harder than programming a software router. And two, can we design a stateful instruction set that supports all these algorithms, which is at once expressive and also high performance enough to run at line rate? So concretely, we have three contributions. One is this abstraction called packet transactions. That is a high-level programming model for data plane algorithms. And we show how several algorithms fit quite neatly into this abstraction. Two, at the other end of the stack, we have this low-level abstraction called an atom, which is a consistent representation for switch instruction sets for switches that run at line rate. And we show seven concrete stateful instructions that we've come up with using these atoms that switch designers can use. And finally, we have a compiler that bridges the gap between this, these high and low level abstractions. And we show how we can use this to iteratively design switch instruction sets. So let's go through each in turn. So first, this packet transaction abstraction. So a packet transaction is this block of imperative code that captures an algorithm's logic. Formally, the semantics are straightforward. A packet comes in, there's some transaction that captures the packet processing that should happen for that packet. It ends up updating some packet fields and some state. It finishes execution for that packet, and only then does it move on to the next packet. So as a programmer, you have this illusion of a single packet being processed at once, serially, almost like you're programming on an infinitely fast software router. So an example is useful here. So here, we, we're going to count from 0 through 9 and sample every 10th packet by writing the source IP address into a designated sample field. So packet.sample is an example of a packet field while count is an example of persistent state on the switch. So when p1 shows up, count is at 0. Um, so we take the if branch, we don't sample it. Similarly with p2, we don't sample it. And when p10 shows up, count is at 9. So we take the top half of this transaction, 
count gets reset to zero, and P10 gets sampled. Right? So the neat thing here is you can specify the input-output behavior of this algorithm without any reference to the underlying switch capabilities, such as pipelines or number of stages and so on. OK. So as much as the programmer programs to this abstraction of one packet at a time, the switch underneath is heavily pipelined. And in fact, it does process multiple packets at a time concurrently to retain these high performance guarantees. So let's look a little deeper into what one of these switches looks like. So there's a pipeline of match action tables. And the match part of this table really just filters out packets based on some predicates. And all the interesting packet processing happens in the action. So let's just focus on the action units for now. These are small digital circuits that take a packet field or a set of packet fields, modify them in some way, and ship them off to the next stage. When they do this, they could also maintain some persistent state in the data plane, which is local to that action unit. And they could read and update the state as part of their packet processing. So when a packet goes through a stage, it's basically transformed by all of these atoms in parallel. And each atom operates on a disjoint subset of the packet. And then it goes to the next stage. So now in steady state, you can assume packets are just going through this pipeline, one after the other, quite literally in lockstep. And each stage of this pipeline on typical switches today processes about a packet every nanosecond, because these pipelines run at a gigahertz. OK. So this combination of the action unit plus the state that it operates on, we call this an atom to denote the fact that it captures the smallest unit of atomic packet processing that the hardware provides. It's atomic in the sense that if you update state as part of the atom, that updated state is visible to the very next packet that arrives into that atom. So here's an example atom that we made up. So x is some state variable. And we either add or multiply a constant based on the choice of the uh, based on the choice parameter. So this is an example of an atom. And in fact, you could create many such atoms to define an entire instruction set for the switch. Uh, you would concretely have to do three things: define a set of atoms, figure out what the depth of the pipeline is in terms of the number of stages and figure out how wide the pipeline is in terms of the number of atoms per stage. So that would give you the instruction set. OK. So there's a difference between atoms that do and do not manipulate persistent switch state. Um, and I'll illustrate with this with an example, because it affects the design process for how a switch designer would develop each of these atoms. So for the stateless case, let's look at an operation that adds two packet fields, subtracts a third, and then writes it into a fourth. So one way to do this is to have a two-stage pipeline with two atoms. The first atom takes F1 and F2 and the incoming packet and writes F1 plus F2 into temp. Right? Now, the next stage takes F3, subtracts it from temp, and writes it into F4. Now, this general idea of decomposing a stateless operation into a sequence of pairwise operations on pairs of packet fields applies to more complicated stateless operations as well. And in general, this means it's easy to pipeline these stateless operations. So as a switch designer, you can go ahead and optimize the best set of instructions for a pair of stateless, uh, for a pair of packet fields, and leave the job of taking an arbitrary stateless operation and decomposing it into a pipeline to the compiler. So this considerably simplifies the life of the switch designer when it comes to stateless operations. Now let's look at whether the same pipelining trick can apply to a stateful operation, like a counter. So here's a possible pipeline where you read the counter into a temporary value temp in the packet, increment that, and then write back temp into the state. So let's assume you have two packets, red and green, that show up at clock cycle 0 and 1. Now, at clock cycle 0, temp shows up. Uh, red shows up. After clock cycle 1, red's temp has become 0, and green has just shown up at this point. At the end of clock cycle 2, green's temp picks up the value 0 because it still sees the old value of the state, because it's not yet been updated in the memory. 
Now you can probably see where this is going. As this green packet process progresses through the pipeline, it gets incremented through the second stage to one, and it eventually writes one into the state x. But really, the value at this point should be two, not one. Right? So this, this doesn't work. This doesn't guarantee atomicity. The problem is, by splitting this atomic operation into a sequence of three stages, we've not, we don't guarantee atomicity anymore. And the only way we know of to make this atomic is to explicitly provide this read, modify, write operation that reads x, adds 1, writes it back in one stage that completes within a single clock cycle. And this observation is more generally true for this pattern of read, modify, write for stateful operations. And there is no easy recipe to pipeline these things by breaking them down at various points. And you actually need the hardware to support the entire read, modify, write within a clock cycle in a single stage. Now, the result of this is that some of the stateful atoms can look fairly involved. This is a fairly hairy example of a stateful atom. And the circuit is inscrutable for a reason, because this, this is fairly complicated. This is what the stateful atom tries to do. It updates state in one of four ways based on four predicates, where each predicate depends on the state. Now, that entire mouthful of logic is represented in that circuit on the left-hand side. And in general, this is true for these stateful operations, where fairly complicated modify operations need to all finish within a clock cycle in order to guarantee atomicity. As a result, these operations end up looking much richer and much different from garden variety x86 or MIPS instructions. OK. So I've spoken about a high-level packet transaction abstraction and a low-level atom abstraction. How do we bridge the gap? So we have a compiler that does this. And I'll briefly describe how the compiler works. The details are in the paper. So let's take the same packet sampling code again. The programmer writes this code in an imperative language called Domino, where the major restriction is the lack of loops, because we don't know of a way to synthesize for loops on a line rate switch. We feed this to a compiler that does two things. It extracts out these codelets, which are fragments of code, which, when run atomically, guarantee the transaction semantics. And then the second thing the compiler does is to map these codelets down to atoms in the hardware. Now, when doing this mapping, it might turn out that the atom cannot support the codelet, because maybe the atom is only a counter, but you want to do x equal to x times phi. In such cases, the code is rejected. So this is unlike a software router where all code is compiled, but the performance depends on the code's complexity. Here, only some code compiles, but all compiled code runs at line rate. So let's see how we use this compiler to first design a programmable switch and then co compile to these just designed switches. The compiler takes three inputs, an atom, um, a pipeline of such atoms, like basically the depth and width, and the algorithm itself. And it tells you whether the algorithm would run on a pipeline with that atom. right? And invariably, the algorithm doesn't run the first time around. You end up either increasing the number of atoms in the pipeline or, the atom it's, or changing the atom itself. And you keep iterating for a while. right? At some point, the algorithm does compile, and then you move on to another algorithm and repeat this process until you have an atom that you're satisfied with. And that's the atom that you go ahead and implement. Now, again, we're going to be focusing on stateful atoms because the stateless operations are easily pipelined. So I'll just show a quick demo of this at work. So for this, we first need um, an example algorithm. And the example that we have is what I call the learning bloom filter, which tracks pairs of source and destination IP ports in the data plane. So for this, it needs to maintain the state here, which is three arrays for the bloom filter. This is persistent state on the switch. Then there's this packet transaction, which has a signature that takes a packet as the argument. And it does three things. It first computes three indices using hashes. It then checks the membership bits at those locations. And finally, sets them so that it learns the new pair of ports. OK. We now need a pipeline of atoms to compile this to. And the simplest atom I can think of is what I call a read-write atom, which allows you to either read a piece of state or 
write either a constant or a packet field using a mux into that piece of state, right? Now, let's compile learn filter onto a pipeline with such read write atoms. And just because we need to come up with some numbers, let's assume a pipeline depth and width of 10. And here it takes a while and it sort of finds a mapping to the pipeline and, and it also reports what the pipeline configuration looks like. Now this makes sense because the Bloom filter only tests or sets bits in the data print. It doesn't do much else. Now let's move on to a slightly more complicated algorithm, which is a heavy hitter detector. So we're using a countman sketch underneath to implement this, and each row in the countman sketch is a separate array. That's the state we maintain. Again, the logic within the packet transaction is straightforward. You hash into these different rows. Uh, you detect a heavy hitter by checking if all those rows exceed a threshold. And because this is a counting sketch, you basically increment all those locations in an array. Now, when I say count sketch, it should raise this immediate concern that because we, we need to increment locations, we can't just use an atom that writes a new packet field or a constant into a location on every packet. Instead, we need the ability to read, modify, and then write back. So let's see if the compiler can actually catch that. So we run the same command as before, except we replace learn filter with heavy hitters, right? And now the compiler tells us that the atom isn't expressive enough. So now we iterate by looking at a more complicated atom. And the next most complicated atom that we could think of was this atom that takes state x and adds either a packet field or a constant to x and writes it back. Now hopefully by setting constant to 1, you can implement the countman sketch. So let's see if the compiler catches that. Right, now I'm running the same heavy hitters algorithm on a pipeline of raw atoms. And at this point, it takes a while and it actually finds a map. Okay? So we can in fact go through this process more and more with more and more algorithms and design an entire hierarchy of such atoms. The first two are the ones that I demonstrated. And we lay out this hierarchy such that every atom on this list can express all the computations that its predecessors can. Right? OK, so now that we have the atoms, let's see how we can compile some algorithms down to them. We picked a set of algorithms that span a variety of networking functionality, like measurement, data plane load balancing, congestion control, and so on. When we express them as packet transactions, the number of lines of code isn't very different from how you would program these in a software router or a simulation platform. We then took these algorithms and compiled them to a pipeline of each of the atoms we mentioned, so every possible combination. And here, I'm listing the most demanding stateful capability from the hardware that is needed to run that algorithm at line rate. The interesting thing here is the cardinal algorithm that doesn't map because it requires a square root on state which is beyond any of the atoms we support. And this is generally true. No matter what atoms you have, there will be algorithms that fall outside its scope. How many atoms do we need? This is the minimum pipeline depth and width to make these things work. And if you multiply them, less than 100 atom instances are sufficient. And how feasible is this? We took these atoms, wrote them as circuits in Verilog, and synthesized them to a recent transistor library. And we were able to show that all of them meet timing at a gigahertz. And they actually occupy very little additional area related to, for, to a switching chip. So these are the area numbers. And overall, the overhead is less than a percent for about 100 instances. Now, clearly, this number depends on the number of atom instances. But the high level message is that the number is small. To conclude, uh, I've presented three things here, a high level abstraction for programming the data plane a low-level abstraction to consistently represent switch instruction sets, and a compiler that goes between the two, which you can also use to iteratively design these instruction sets in the first place. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>
Yeah. I have a quick question. It's sort of a philosophical question. Do you think uh, sort of atomic transactions are the right primitive for building these pipelines, or are there cases that you've thought about or found where maybe some weaker guarantees would, would be sufficient and might let you have a more flexible compilation strategy? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think transactions simplify thinking about the problem because you get this guarantee that every packet is processed according to this piece of code. We've thought about weaker models like maybe guaranteeing these transaction semantics only on a sampling of the packets because you're not able to do this on every packet. Um, but we don't have any concrete answers to that yet. Yeah. Hey, Kostin Raichu from uh, Polting Upgrades. Very, very cool work. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, um, are you now doing sort of the reverse process, going to P4 and see, you know, uh, if you apply your methodology, what, what atoms you need for, for P4 and stuff like that to, to, to make it run? Because in, in a sense, you know, it's uh, with P4, they said let's make sort of open flow more extensible, whereas you sort of took this principle approach. So I'm just wondering whether you expect to actually look at the differences and, you know, what might arise if you actually took this approach and tried to do what P4 did. So, okay, I can s understand that question a few ways. One is like what, can, like, what can we learn from P4 and what can this contribute to P4? So we do have a P4 backend that generates correct P4 code from a packet transaction. And in a way, it automates the process of generating fairly tedious configurations in P4. At some level, this idea of a transaction is something that you know, I've spoken to some people about, um, maybe as adding as a pragma to P4, where you give these atomic guarantees on blocks of uh, code. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see whether that fits with the rest of the P4 ecosystem. But I think at the very least, the sort of immediate step is you can generate P4 code that can run on any P4 supported target. Maybe while we ask the next question, we can get the next speaker set up. So this is a uh, really cool work, uh, Marco Canini again. Um, so one thing that you mentioned during the talk is that the language that you have, Domino, does not support for loops, so I guess cycles in general. I wonder if you had put any thought into you know, how to, however, support them, in, even though in a primitive manner, uh, because many uh, useful algorithms to, you know, can, can, can be much better expressed with for loops, if not the required for loops? Yeah, so that's a good question. I think at the very least we can support for loops that iterate a constant number of times that are compile time unrollable. So we can certainly provide that as syntactic sugar. We haven't done that so far, but that's certainly something we can do. But the general case, yeah, I don't think we can solve that. <laughs> 